inspired to go and preach this to the royal family. Hallelujah. And so, you know, God said to them, look, stop mourning for Josiah. Josiah was a good king. And we went through last week on all the things that he did and how he got rid of the bell worshipers and the bell idols that were around. And he cleansed the temple and he read from the word of God. He made uh, the whole nation repent. And so God says, don't cry for him, you know, because he has gone on. He will not see the ruin of this city. God promised Josiah that he would die before the uh, before Judah was taken into captivity and before Nebuchadnezzar and his army came in to destroy Jerusalem. And so God is saying, don't weep for him. You know, weep for his son. And so his middle son, Jehoahaz, at this time is now king. And he did what was evil in the sight of God. He taxed the people. He called, he put a heavy burden upon the people. Why? So that he could live in a better palace. So that he could have money at his disposal. And so God caused the king of Egypt to come and get him and depose of him and be carried away as a prisoner, just as God had threatened that he would do. And so it does not appear that any of the people were taken in, into captivity with him, but they were the ones that chose him because normally the firstborn becomes king after the father, but the people chose Jehoahaz. They chose him. And so he was wicked. And God says, weep not for the dead. Don't weep anymore for Josiah. And so even Jeremiah had himself been a mourner for Josiah and has stirred the people up to mourn for Josiah. But God told him, stop mourning for him. Because he is fine, he he is uh, he lived out, he did what was right. The one that you need to weep for is the one that has now been taken into captivity. Turn your tears uh, and, and towards him. You know, weep for him. And so he says, weep sorely for Jehoahaz, who had gone into Egypt. Not that there was any great loss of him to the public, as there was of his father, but that this case was much more deplorable. And Josiah went to the grave in peace and honor. He was prevented from seeing the evil to come in this world and removed to see the good to come in the other world. And therefore weep not for him but for his unhappy son, who is likely to live and die in disgrace and misery, a wretched captive. Hallelujah. And so he said, don't weep for Josiah, but weep for him. Glory to God. And so God says that he wanted them to do justice for the fatherless. He wanted them to do justice to the widows. He wanted them to do justice for the foreigners. And so also in Matthew 25, it tells us, you know, to visit the sick, to visit those who are in prison. And so I want uh, to just give some information where that is concerned, because since I have been uh, working with healing communities, you guys know that um, I work with an, um, a, a nonprofit organization. And what we do is that we train churches how to work with the family members who have incarcerated loved ones right there in their own church. And so uh, we've been doing uh, that, oh, I've been doing that now for uh, about three years. And so I want us to look at 
the prison system because what I found out is that most times pastors or even the church members uh, know that they've been called to do this kind of work, but they don't know how to get started. So I just want to have a look, give you a little bit of information and then some suggestions on how you can get started. You want to come work with Healing Communities? That would be great. Uh, Prison Fellowship is another. We're also going to look at um, those who are now orphans, uh, the fatherless. We're going to look at those. Um, and we'll look at, you know, uh, how do we serve those who are widows? Uh, so in um, 2018, there were 68.5 million married men, 69.25 married women living in the United States. But this is compared to 11.41 million widow women and 3.47 million widow men. So there are millions of uh, widows, uh, who are women and, and men. We don't want to forget about them as well. So they are definitely uh, all around us. Uh, and, and we need to understand why it is because of the things that they go through as widows. Most widows live in poverty. Most widows and widowers lose touch with their in-laws within a year of a loss. Uh, most widows lose 75% of their support base when their spouse dies. It is really possible uh, to die from a, bro a broken heart. And so widows and widowers have a 30% elevated risk of death in the first six months after their spouses uh, die uh, because they are broken hearted. And for the past 30 or more years, the rate of poverty among elderly widows is consistently three to four times higher than elderly married women. Uh, another issue is that insomnia is one of the most common symptoms for a grieving spouse. And so these are the things that widows and widowers go through. Um, and you know, so the Lord says, you know, do good for them, do justice for them by serving them, by helping them in any way that you can. Do not forget about them. And so God also says that he wants us to look after the fatherless, the orphans, those who are in our uh, welfare system, foster care system. And so let's just look at a few uh, statistics where that's concerned. 96,000 of these children are available to be adopted. There are 96,000 children right now who are in the foster care system, and this is just in the United States. That, and they need to be adopted. 26,000 kids in foster care age out of the system or are emancipated every year. In uh, the District of Columbia, there are 1,179 children in the foster care system as of 2018. This is these are statistics from 2018. 2019 hasn't come out yet. And so there are 1,183 children uh, in their homes but under the watch of DC Child and Family Services. Uh, so they are still with their parents, but they are either being abused or neglected. And so uh, the Child and Family Services had to step in. There are 108 children who have the goal of adoption right now in the DC system. Children in foster care in DC spend an average of 46 months in the system, nearly twice the national average. And 77% of kids in DC waiting to be adopted are over 11 years old 
and at risk of aging out of hair. On average, for every young person who ages out of foster care, taxpayers and communities pay $300,000 in social costs over that person's lifetime. So when they do age out, it costs you and me as taxpayers uh, to pay for uh, you know, their, their lives. And social costs includes uh, taxpayer-funded costs such as public assistance and incarceration, as well as costs absorbed by the community such as wages lost as a result of dropping out of high school. And so studies show that of the children who age out of the system without a permanent family, 12 to 30 percent struggle with homelessness, 40 to 63 percent do not complete high school, 32 to 40 percent are forced to rely on some form of public assistance, and 50 percent experience extreme financial hardship, 18 to 20 percent are incarcerated. And so with 26,000 youth being emancipated each year, this adds up to nearly $8 billion in cost to the country. And so these are things that the church can get involved in, in ministering to these kids, maybe even becoming foster parents, helping to change these kids' lives, so that it's not such a heavy burden uh, on taxpayers or on our, uh, on our country. Because as the church, we have ministered to them, we have helped them, we have prayed for them, they have received Jesus Christ, they know how to pray for themselves, you know, all these things, and that they can avoid homelessness, they can graduate from high school, they do not have to up, uh, be in extreme financial hardships, and they certainly do not have to end up being in prison. And so there are ways that um, you can get involved. Uh, DC 127 wants to keep kids from spending a quarter of their childhood in care, and they aim to match adolescents at risk of aging out with loving families before uh, they are emancipated. So even if you don't want to become um, a foster care parent, you can still get involved. There are many ways in which you can help. Uh, you can help other families. You can work directly with the kids. Um, you can help recruit families to foster and adopt uh, these uh, young people to ensure that they don't spend four years bouncing around and that they never have to leave the safety of a loving home. And so I provided the, um, the link here. You can go and check it out and, and see uh, what is happening with that. Uh, go and read all about them and ways. It's an opportunity to get involved. You can sew monthly. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to give um, another place that you can go to is uh, Jim Casey's Youth Opportunities Initiative. Uh, their website um, gives detailed information. Uh, they're actually uh, funded by the same foundation that started in the communities, the Annie e. Casey Foundation. And so they work with youth, um, older children, and they, uh, their whole system is to change um, the, the way that the laws uh, affect those who are, are foreign, unfatherless. And so their whole um, organization helps to advocate on behalf of, of those who are in foster care on the local, state, and national level to advance policies and practices to most effectively meet the needs of young people transitioning from foster care to adulthood. So they primarily work with those who are about to be 
um, emancipated. So these are ways that you can get involved. Certainly go to their websites. I'm sure there are many others uh, that are around, but I know that these specifically work in uh, the DMV area. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to be back next week with part two, uh, repenting of injustice. And we're going to look at uh, the prison system. We're going to look at for-profit prisons uh, and how African-American men are being traded still, not on a plantation, but um, within the stock market every day. African-Americans are, are still being traded through our prison system. And so we want to look at them and we also want to look at how immigrants are being treated. Uh, we're going to look at details and some statistics on that. And I just believe that once we understand and we know the details, then we can understand how we can get involved. God can then give us wisdom in direction and how we can be involved. There's just so many ways uh, in which uh, as a church. So let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you uh, for this word. Uh, we're so grateful, God, for how you are just encouraging us. God, we are, are indeed uh, repenting of injustice. If we have in any way practiced injustice, oh God, we repent. God, if you told us to do something and we did not do it, we repent in the name of Jesus. You have called many of us, Lord God, to operate in um, giftings and ministries that Maybe, God, we felt afraid like Jeremiah. Maybe we thought we were too young. We thought we were too old. Or uh, like Moses, we, don't know, we felt that we didn't know how to talk right, oh God. But Lord God, we just uh, repent right now because there's always a way. If we trust you, certainly sitting idle is not the answer. Doing nothing is not the answer. And so, God, we're just praying right now, God, that you will wash us clean that you would give us uh, an opportunity to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying uh, where widows, orphans, and immigrants are concerned. Lord God, that you will open up our eyes. Uh, God, that we will walk in the anointing that you have placed upon us. God, that we will not be limited, that we will not be so focused and overwhelmed by our own issues, oh God. That we're so busy trying to take care of ourselves and for our, for our families, Lord, your word says in Matthew 6, 33, Lord God, to take no thought for our lives, what we shall eat and what we shall drink. That if we seek first the kingdom of God, that all of these things shall be added to us. You will be our provider. You will be our Jehovah Jireh, God, that you will literally see to it, God, that we have all these things. Uh, so I pray, Father God, Lord, that we will operate uh, according to your will and that uh, we will uh, not uh, be uh, operating in disobedience and not know it, oh God. Uh, God, so many of us, God, help us, wash us, and cleanse us. God, strengthen us, strengthen our hands, give us the resources that are needed, Lord God, to go into our community. Uh, we have been called to impact DMV, uh, Lord, and not only will we do so with the word of God, with the love of God, uh, with the blood of Jesus, but Lord God, we will do so on behalf of those who have been brokenhearted, those who have been bruised, those who have been held captive, and like Jesus, uh, we declare that the spirit of the Lord is upon us, for he has anointed us to heal those who are brokenhearted. Oh God, to set free those who are being held captive, to set at liberty those who have been ensnared by traps and uh, simply because of the condition of their lives, Lord God. And so we thank you, Father God, for uh, just the power of God that rests upon us. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we'll be back next week uh, with uh, Repenting of Injustice Part 2. 
See you then. God bless you. Take care of yourselves.